I'm going to go over the 11 problems um, I posted in GoFormative as a review for the Unit 4 test on Friday. And they're the same problems that I went over in lecture this morning, but I thought I'd, I'd work them out again in case they in case you didn't get them or you weren't able to join us. So the first question simply asked you, um, well, they're KSP, and it said, which of these is least soluble? So just to write a couple things that you can jot down or remember to help you. If you're talking about KSP problem, the most soluble is going to be one with the largest KSP value. Okay, so now keep in mind, by definition, these are relatively insoluble compounds. So none of them are going to have large KSPs. But if you're comparing one KSP to another, and so again, if it asks you for the least soluble like this problem did, you want the smallest KSP. Okay, and smallest, of course, when you're talking about scientific notation, means the most negative exponent, right? And so the answer for this one was lead sulfide, uh, which has a KSP of 8 times 10 to the minus 28. Okay, so it's almost none of that dissolves. All righty, so the next KS, I think there were three KSP problems. And the next one we did asked or gave the solubility of calcium fluoride and asked to calculate the KSP. That is my dog whining because she wants to go play fetch. All right, so now this is what I emphasize. The thing you need to keep straight is solubility represents X in an ice table. Okay, It is literally the molarity of calcium fluoride that dissolves. Okay, just what it sounds like. Notice that the units, right, are moles per liter. K, on the other hand, is not solubility, okay? They're two different things. K is a ratio of concentration of products to reactants. Totally different things. So anyway, this problem gave us X or gave us solubility. So regardless of what type of problem KSP problem it is, if it is a KSP problem, the first thing that you want to do is write out the equilibrium that shows dissociation and dissolving of the slightly soluble salt. And of course, as all ionic compounds, when they dissolve, they separate into the individual ions. And be very careful, any subscripts in the slightly soluble ionic compound become coefficients. So it's important to get a balanced reaction here. All right, so now you have that. Remember that if you're doing an ice table, okay, the insoluble salt, since it's termed as a solid for the most part, does not affect equilibrium, put a big X through it. Um, then, as always, products are zero to begin with. For every X of calcium that forms, you get 2X of fluoride, right? And so to, to calculate the KSP value for this equilibrium, it's the concentration of calcium ion times the concentration of fluoride ion squared. And so plugging in the equilibrium values we got from the ice table, okay, calcium was simply X, fluorine was 2X. Now, just to point out again, whenever you have a coefficient inside parentheses in a KSB problem, it's also going to be an exponent. So you're always going to feel like you did something twice, but that's the way it should be. All right, so when we do the math with that, we get that KSP is 4x cubed. And the problem gave us the value 4x, the solubility. And so let's go ahead and plug that in. So KSP equals 4, 
and x that they gave us was 3.9 times 10 to the minus 11. And so when you put that into your calculator, you get that KSP is 2.4 times 10 to the minus 31. All right, so the lesson out of here is to make sure you know the difference between solubility and KSP. The third and last KSP problem was one that asks you to find the solubility and they give you KSP. So the given KSP is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 16. And as always, you want to write out the equilibrium. So this is lead hydroxide. Whoops, it's not aqueous, is it? It's solid. Okay, and that, when it dissolves, dissociates into the ions. Alrighty, so now we can go ahead and set up an ice table, just like we did before. Cross out the solid material. Products are zero to begin with. Whoopee. And once you have the equilibrium values, I'm going to go ahead and plug those into KSP. I know I've, I've told you before, but I think it's really important to write the generic form of KSP okay, before you plug in the X values. Because if you don't do that, if you go straight to the X values, so many people forget when there's an exponent. So... It ends up being our very common 4x cubed. All right, so in this case, we were given KSP. It's 2.8 times 10 to the minus 16. And so go ahead and simplify that. I guess we can, well, you have to start by dividing both sides by 4. And you think I would have learned. I'm pulling out my calculator again. And so then we get 7 times 10 to the minus 17 is x cubed. Go ahead and take the cube root of both sides. And when we do that, we get that our answer is... 4.1 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, 6, minus 6. Okay, and solubility is X, okay? So it tells us the concentration of lead hydroxide that actually dissolves. We are going to switch gears to buffers now, and there are a couple of um, buffer conceptual questions that I'm going to address. And um, one of them was, um, what of the following um, solutions would be best for making a buffer that could be controlled at a pH of 8? All right. So the, the rule of thumb there is that you want your pKa for the weak acid that makes up your buffer to be um, as close to the value of P e pH, as close to the value of pH that you want to control the buffer at as possible. All right, so um, pKa, just kind of remind you, is minus log of Ka, and this problem gives us a whole bunch of Ka's. So in that case, all you would do is find the Ka of each and whichever, find the pKa of each, and whichever one is closest to eight is your winner. So I'll just do a couple of them. So there's one, let's see, formic acid and sodium formate, and the Ka of formic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4, and so pKa would be minus log 
of that value, and let's just see what that would be. 1.8. Okay, so the pKa for that one would be 3.74. That is not very close to 8, right? So that's very unlikely. Now, just to kind of remind you, um, when you take the log of a value, what you're really doing is taking the exponent and bringing it down. So you see the exponent here was close to four, then our pKa value is going to be close to four. And so to save you some time, um, since you want pKa to be about equal to pH, what you're looking for is a Ka value that is on the order of 10 to the minus 8. Okay? pH 8, because when you take the log of it, or the, the minus log of it, you're going to get just what you want, pH and 8. And if you look at the answer choices, there's only one answer that has uh, only one substance that has a Ka with an exponent of 8, minus 8. And that is... Um, hypochlorous acid and its conjugate base. And the Ka of hypochlorous acid is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 8. And so you can either plug it in and find pKa of it if you want to prove it to yourself, or if you just remember that whatever the exponent is should match the pH you're trying to control to. So if I take the minus log of that just to show you what it would be, I get that pKa equals 7.5. So they're not going to be always exactly equal, but that's close enough to 8 to be able to control it um, pretty tightly around that pH. There is another buffer conceptual problem um, that says which of the following is not a buffer system. So for this, you just have to remember the definition of buffer. A buffer contains a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid. So the bottom line is buffers, they don't work as buffers if you have strong acids or base in them. Okay, so no strong acids or bases. So let's look at all the option choices now this says which of the following is not a buffer system. So let's just look at the first one. The first one is hydrofluoric acid and its conjugate base. Hydrofluoric acid is one of the weak acids. Make sure you have a copy of strong acids and bases jotted down or printed out for this test and for the final, okay? So this could make a buffer. Let's go on to the next one. Bromide ion and hydrobromic acid. Well, it turns out the hydrobromic acid is one of the strong acids. So that could not, cannot make a buffer. So all of the other choices are, are not strong acids. So all the other ones could, in fact, make a buffer if they're paired with a conjugate base. But hydrobromic cannot because it is a strong acid. Onward to an actual buffer calculation. Now, if all you're dealing with is a buffer and it hasn't been disturbed or anything done with it, it's really easy. So this particular problem asks us to calculate the pH of a buffer system. And let's say they said it's made up of 0.3 molar ammonia and 0.2 molar of its conjugate acid, which is ammonium chloride. And Ka for the ammonium chloride equals 5.62 times 10 to the minus 10. Alrighty, so, okay, so let me go through a list of things you have to do when you take the test. First of all, you have to ask yourself, is this a buffer I'm dealing with? This is a little bit different than you're used to looking at, which is why I picked it, really. Okay, so if you notice that two components in a mixture are conjugate pairs with each other, um, that's typically a buffer. 
Um, so just to kind of mention NH4Cl, um, it is ionic, and as soon as it dissolves in water, it's going to separate into these individual ions. So NH3 actually is the conjugate acid of NH, sorry, NH4 plus is the conjugate acid of NH3. All right, so anytime you have a buffer, you need to know the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And let's just remember that the concentration or moles of the base goes in the numerator here. Very common mistake. So let's just plug, plug in everything we know. So pKa is going to be minus log of the Ka, which was given to you. I can't read my own, own handwriting. There we go. And, okay, so you got to make sure you know what the base is. The base is going to be NH3. And... The acid is going to be NH4+. Plus. Alrighty, so now you just go ahead and plug everything in. And let's see, 5.62 times 10 to the 10. And we gotta take log of that. So that gives you 9.25. And let me plug in these values here. Uh, 0.3 molar NH3, 0.2 molar NH4. So log of 1.5. All right. pH equals 9.43. And that is it. So simple buffalo problems are hard. The one we're getting ready to do is look quite a bit trickier, actually. Um, and that's called disturbing a buffer. All right, so here's the last buffer problem. And this is a disturbing the buffer. And that's going to be a tricky, much trickier than just a plain buffer. So the buffer is made up of sodium fluoride and hydrogen fluoride. So just a reminder is these ionic compounds are always going to be a source of the conjugate base. Oop, gotta let my dogs out. All right, so what we wanna do then is we wanna look at what we have disturbed the um, buffer with, and we have done that with, let's see, HCl. All right, so the first question you need to ask yourself when you have disturbed a buffer is which of the two buffer components will this disturbing component contaminant react with? So it's an acid in this case. It's going to react with the base. Acids react with bases. So the first thing you have to do in a disturb the buffer problem is write a balanced reaction between the contaminant and the component of the buffer that it's going to react with. And now always, when you have a contaminant reacting with half of the buffer, you're going to make the other half of the buffer. Okay, that's, that's part of the magic of a buffer. So you're going to go back and forth between the conjugate pairs if contamination occurs. So now you're going to do a mole table. You have a chemical reaction going on here, so as always, you need moles. And since they are solutions, in order to find moles, you have to multiply molarity by volume. And so let's go ahead and do that for everything. HCl, we had, let's see, 50 milliliters of, and it was 0.6 molar. And if you haven't noticed already, I keep my volume in milliliters, so I end up getting millimoles instead of moles, but you can convert it to liters and use moles if you're more comfortable. And so as far as the fluoride, I have 100 milliliters of 0.4 molar. And then hydrogen fluoride, don't forget that, it's not zero for products because your buffer had hydrogen fluoride to begin with. So again, the buffer solution, there were 100 milliliters of it and the hydrogen fluoride was at 0.3 molar. 
All right, so those are the initial moles for everything. So if you calculate that out, you're going to have 30 millimoles of the contaminant acid, 40 millimoles of the conjugate base that it's going to react with, and 30 moles to begin with of the other component of the buffer, buffer hydrogen fluoride. So whatever's the smaller amount is the limiting reactant is going to be used up. So all of that acid is going to react so that you're going to have none of the contaminant left. That's the point of a buffer. Gobbles up contaminants. It's going to chew up a considerable amount of the conjugate base, but you still will have 10 millimoles of F minus left. And it's going to make more of hydrogen fluoride. So you're actually gonna have 60 millimoles of the hydrogen fluoride. So now you've done your, your um, mole table. And now since you're still dealing with a buffer, although the ratio has changed, you still need Henderson-Hasselbalch. So reminder for you again, in the Henderson-Hasselbalch in this ratio, the base component always goes on top. So let's plug in what we know. The Ka for hydrogen fluoride is given at 7.2 times 10 to the minus 4. All right, and then the moles of base is 10, and the moles of the acid component of the buffer is 60. And when you plug all of those in, you get, hmm, let's see. All right, so the, let me squeeze it in down here. 3.14 is the pKa. And then 10 divided by 60, and log of that is minus 0.778. And putting those together, you then get a pH of 2.36. So that's it for the buffer problems. So now I'm going to do the titration problems. Okay, doc. So the first titration problem I'm going to do has um, starts with nitric acid, and it's being titrated with KOH. So I just want to make a connection that maybe will help you. Um, when we had a disturb the buffer problem, it ended up the first thing we did is do an acid base balanced reaction. And so a disturb the buffer problem works very similar to a titration. So our products here are going to be water and the salt. And then since anytime it's a chemical reaction, you want to calculate the mole change. And so we need to get the volume and the molarity of all of the components. So there are 80 milliliters of nitric acid and the concentration of that was 0.4. And KOH, um, there were 40 mils. And the concentration of that was 0.8. So hopefully you notice pretty quickly that you have 32 millimoles of the original acid that you were titrating and the same amount, 32 millimoles of the potassium hydroxide you're titrating with, and this is the equivalence point. So that's really important to know because regardless of what type of acid it is you're titrating, the equivalence point is a critical point and you need to know how to handle it. Now this is an easy problem because nitric acid is a strong acid. And what does that mean? So this is really important to know. So the pH at the equivalence point 
for a strong acid is always seven. Okay, the equivalent, the pH at the equivalence point for a strong acid is always seven. So you stop, you don't have to do anything else. And in fact, you didn't even have to do this mole table. If you get, sometimes you just get used to multiplying in your head volume by molarity, just even as you read a problem. And so you might pick up pretty early that, oh, I have equal amounts of these, I'm at the equivalence point. So when you do realize that, and if you have a strong acid, um, you know that that's neutral, so you're done. So weak acids are not so easy. So we're going to do titration of a weak acid next. All righty. So this problem asks to calculate the pH of, um, it's called cyanic acid, with sodium hydroxide. And so this is not one of the strong acids. Again, make sure you write down or print out a list of strong acids and bases so you don't end up questioning that. It is a weak acid, so we're going to have to be careful. Those are harder problems. And um, so what are we going to make? Now, this is a funky looking acid to me. I don't like it. It confuses me. So I'm just going to put HA because it's not going to affect the difference. And so what I always get then is the hydrogen from the weak acid is going to make water and then the salt. I have, you probably noticed by now that I usually just take the cation off um, and just hydroxide, but it doesn't matter, whatever you're more comfortable with. But you get a reaction and realize that since this is a weak acid, the instant we start titrating, we are going to create a buffer because you have a weak acid and as soon as you add the base, you are also going to get some of its conjugate base and those together create a buffer and that's why this, a titration of a weak acid is so similar to a buffer problem. So let's go ahead. We have, that means we treat it the same way of disturbing a buffer. So we have to do a mole table. And then we have to use henderson hasselbach So I'm going to calculate moles by multiplying the volume by the molarity. So I have 75 millimoles of the weak acid. and 37.5 millimoles of hydroxide have been added. Okay, so hydroxide as usual is a limiting reactant. It's all going to react. And of course, when it reacts, it's going to make the conjugate base, so that's a plus, and water we don't care about. All right, so you may have already noticed that we are at a special point in this titration, but I went through the mole table in case you didn't. Look at the ratio we have of the original, the moles we have of the, bleh, of the original weak acid, and then compare that to the moles we have created with its conjugate base. We have equal amounts. So that's called the halfway point of a titration of a weak acid. And at the halfway point, you may remember that pH equals pKa. So how we got that, I'm going to bore some of you, but it's for a worthy cause. Okay. Um, all right. So if these two have equal concentrations, the ratio is 1 log of one is zero, and so we're left with pH equals pKa at the halfway point. So again, if you happen to notice before you even set up the mole table that you're at the halfway point, I mean half of 150 mils is 75, right, and the concentrations are the same, then you can stop everything you're doing and just calculate pKa, all right? So pKa was given it happens to be 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4. And so pKa equals 
And I'm so messy with hair. Okay, so PKA, I'll write it here, is 3.46. So that's the correct answer to this question. I think we have a couple more titration problems to do. All right, so this is the hardest problem probably of the entire unit, and it's um, pH at the equivalence point of a weak acid. Now, we did pH at the equivalence point of a strong acid. That was just 7. There was nothing to it. So, But if you have a weak acid, and I'm just going to call it HA again, you don't need to know the structure of what the weak acid is. And it is being titrated with sodium hydroxide. I'm going to leave out the sodium. Hopefully that won't mess anybody up. And as always, we get the conjugate base and water. And so we've got to go ahead and I'm just going to prove to you it's equivalence point first. This isn't even really the problem. So if you know right off the bat it's equivalence point, you don't have to do this first mole table. Um, let's see. So we have 25 milliliters of the weak acid but we don't know, they didn't give us the concentration, and we have 35.8 milliliters of the base, and its molarity is 0.020. All right, so the millimoles of base that we have is 0.716 millimoles. Now the problem tells you you're at the equivalence point, okay? So you don't have to figure that out. Um, and so most time you would have to figure it out by, by doing moles of both, but this has a little twist in it. Um, so at the equivalence point, the amount, the moles of base that we've added equals the moles of acid we started with. That's the definition of equivalence point. When you've added enough base to completely react with all of the acid. So now we have millimoles of both of them. Um, they're at the equivalence point, and I will ask you what active or what's present at the equivalence point as far as chemicals. These are all gone. They've neutralized each other. So the only thing that's present at the equivalence point is that conjugate base of the weak acid and water. Now, if this conjugate base were from a strong acid, it would be too weak to do anything with water. But unfortunately, since the conjugate base is from a weak acid, that makes conjugate base stronger, and it can mess with water in the pH. And so here's the actual problem. That conjugate base is going to be in equilibrium with water. It's going to produce a little bit of excess hydroxide, and it's going to make that pH basic. So now what we're doing now is just a simple ice table for a weak base. Okay, so this is a weak base now. Um, and so ice tables are in concentrations. And so we need the concentration of the weak base. So listen carefully. Um, we started with 0.716 moles of the original weak acid. And since they're present in a one-to-one -one ratio, that means that we made 0.716 moles of the conjugate base. So we have the mole amount, but we need molarity. It's an ice table. So as you titrate, you've probably heard me say this before, the volume is continuously changing because you're, you're adding more and more titrant from the burette. And so we need the total volume at the equivalence point. So we started with 25 milliliters of the weak acid, and we added 35.8 milliliters of the base. And so plugging that into our calculator, see what we get. Whoops. And my dogs are coming up and playing ball and breathing really hard, just so you don't think that's me. So the total volume is 60.8 milliliters. And that means that the molarity of the conjugate base we 
hear all the sounds now, slurping water and breathing hard. So the molarity is 0 0.0118. All right, so now it's just a simple weak base um, ice table. So zero of the products to begin with, and we'll just put minus x plus x. And so the equilibrium concentration, the conjugate base is 0 0.0118 minus x. And now we can set up the k value. It would be, um, I'm doing this wrong. It would be HA products times hydroxide divided by concentration A minus. Plugging in equilibrium values we just found from the ice table, you would get x squared over 0 0.0118 minus x. And um, we're gonna go ahead and neglect x. So here's another really important point if you're kind of fading out on me. A minus is a base, and so we need KB. The problem gave us KA, Let's see, Ka, it oh, gave us pKa. So it gave us that pKa is 3.9. And so we can go ahead and find Ka from that. This is all back in unit two, acids and bases and ice tables, pKa, Ka. So actually this is good practice for your final. So let me see what the Ka is. Okay, that tells us that Ka is 1.26 times 10 to the minus four. So I'm not sure if you remember how to find Kb, but it's one times 10 to the minus 14 over Ka. I'm writing in all the holes here. I'm afraid if I go to a new page, I'm gonna to totally lose all this. Um, or not remember. So KB then is one times 10 to the minus 14 over KA, which is 1.26 times 10 to the minus four. And so then that tells us, let's see. All right, so our KB value is really small, which is good, because then we can really neglect x. 7.94 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, 6, 9, 11, 10 to the minus 11. That's KB. All right, so now in my little tiny bit of room up here, how'd that get so fat? What the heck? Oh, well, whatever. I don't know what I just did. Oh, I got it. All right. So now uh, we're going to go ahead and plug in the equilibrium value. So we're going to say x squared over 0 0.0118 equals the KB value we just calculated, 7.94 times 10 to the minus 11. And then I'm going to go ahead and simplify that. Oh, I can erase, can I? I forgot in this program I can erase. Ha, awesome. Very nice. Now I have room. Alrighty. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 0 0.0118. And then that'll tell me that x squared is... Nine point three seven times ten to the let's see three six nine twelve thirteen minus thirteen. Take the square root of both sides. And that tells us that x is nine point six eight times ten to the minus seven.
So you got to remember what X is, though, okay? It is the concentration of hydroxide since this was a base. And so we got to find pOH first. So pOH is minus log of what we just found, 9.68 times 10 to the minus 7. And let's see what that is. So our pOH is 6.01. And that means that pH, if you remember, is 14 minus pOH, 7.99, or I guess if we round it, 8.0. And that is it. That is the answer. And that's it for all of the practice problems I went over in lecture today.